Victor. Um, Victor, briefly, I, I would like to introduce Victor. Um, Victor is associate professor at National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technology University, Singapore. Uh, he is interested in how and what we should teach learners in today's digital and multimodal age. And today he's talking about designing learning with embodied teaching uh, perspective from multimodal modality. Okay, um, Victor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yoshiko, for organizing this. And um, I'd like to also thank uh, Professor Kita and Professor Suzuki for the kind invitation um, to, to speak at this uh, seminar. Um, welcome all the participants. Um, thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. And I would really want to encourage you to make this uh, morning yours. Um, I, will, I have some ideas to share with you, but I want to hear from you as well. So um, I hope that there will be an opportunity for engagement and for you to have your questions answered. Uh, before the session ends. So um, thanks again. Um, my name is uh, Victor. I'm uh, at the National Institute of Education uh, at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. I started out as a language teacher, uh, teaching in a senior high school before um, going uh, to complete my PhD and then moving on subsequently to the Ministry of Education uh, in Singapore, looking after educational technology. So when I was there, I was uh, very much involved in the development of the National ICT in Education Master Plan. And um, the, the years that I spent at MOE HQ has allowed me to think about uh, the, the value of technology in changing the way we teach and learn all subjects, including the English <coughs> language subjects. So I'm gonna share with you some of my thoughts uh, uh, and my research on, on digital learning. And I hope that it will be something that would um, spark off some ideas and um, possibly um, inspire you in different ways as well. Right, the outline um, of my presentation today um, would be first, I would like to share with you this notion of teachers being seen as designers of learning. So it's a paradigm shift of how we view teaching and learning and how technology as a tool for the teachers can come into play. So that will be the first part of my presentation. And then the second uh, part of my presentation is to think about this big question of how can we then design digital learning experiences? What are some of the considerations that we should have? Um, I'm going to part focus in particular on the selection of tools and to think about what are some of the questions we want to ask ourselves when we are choosing the tools in our design of the learning experiences for the students. And finally, I would like to end off by challenging ourselves to think about what are some of the value that technology can bring and how it can potentially change the way we teach language in the classroom. Perhaps when we first started off as teachers, there were certain ideals and aspirations that we have some beliefs that we have about language learning. And today with the development of technology, like what we hear from uh, Professor Yoshiko's talk, there's a lot of opportunities for us to think about how technology can change language education. So is that okay? I invite you to journey with me uh, in the next 25 minutes or so. Good, thank you very much. Um, feel free to also share your thoughts in the chat and I would like to hear from you uh, at the end of it all. So let me begin. What we are most familiar with in teaching or in pedagogy is the notion of the teacher as knowledge authority. Now over decades, really, the teacher is seen as the expert in the classroom, the content expert, the subject disciplinary expert. And um, when the students ask questions, the, stu the teacher is expected to be the one to impart the knowledge. And a lot of teaching and learning interaction focuses very much on the kind of content and understanding that the teacher brings into the pedagogic situation. But I think we have also more recently um, shifted our thinking with regard to the view of the teacher being the knowledge authority to see the teacher as really about facilitating the kind of learning that students have. So if you are familiar with um, educational theories, um, the, the work of Vygotsky uh, championing the idea of social constructivism focuses on the aspect of how students interact and negotiate uh, with one another 
uh, they work in groups, uh, they work in pairs, they are able to share ideas and they are able to learn from one another. And the teacher's role really is just facilitating the learning experience, the learning process of the students. And, and, and I think there's a bit of both. I believe that teachers should be uh, having a little bit more knowledge and content so that we are able to guide the students. I believe that there's a role of teacher facilitating the learning experience. But more than that, I think more recently, there's this thinking in relation to technology that we need to see teachers as designers of learning experiences. Now, what is the difference? And I'm going to share with you a little bit more about, uh, about that later on. The history of pedagogy as design um, is something that was coined by the New London Group uh, in 1996. Now, some of you may have heard of the New London Group. This was a group that introduced to the world the concept of multiliteracies, that language learning in itself may not be sufficient in a world that is very multimodal in nature, uh, where our communication takes place via multimedia. And we need to think about how we can engage with the different type of text, the different type of communicative practices that we have in our world today. So the New London Group came out with the notion of designing learning to think about how we can engage young people with the life, with the life worlds that they inhabit, the kind of communicative practices that they perform on the internet, on social media with one another. Stefan Zelander, a professor um, at Stockholm University, challenges the notion that the role of the teacher is just to bring knowledge to students and the student's role is just to remember by heart and to learn specific skills. And I'm sure all of you share this as well because in today's digital age, really with a, with a mobile phone, with internet access, you are able to almost find any information you like at your fingertip. So in such a, in, in such a world that we live in, what then is the role of a teacher? Now, um, this group of academics see that the teacher take on a role of a designer. So what does it mean that the teacher is a designer of learning? It means that as a designer, the teacher will reflect on the use of the various material resources and structures of power in a specific environment to best express her meanings and orchestrate the learning experience for the students. Now, the idea of a teacher as a designer of learning experience is not just within the academic community, but it has also gained traction in international bodies such as uh, PISA, OECD, where they, um, where they focus on the fact that pedagogy must be deliberately designed, must be well thought through, and it needs to be combined with expertise in the design of learning environments. So really, we should not be seeing teachers as just technicians to implement certain curriculum goals, um, syllabus, procedures from, from the curriculum. But instead, we should think about how teachers should see themselves as designing learning environments, learning experiences, and being expert in the art and science of teaching. So this is an educational research report um, that was published by the OECD. And, and it's one proposition in which they are advancing um, to think about teaching and learning in the digital age. So I have shared with you some very abstract and big ideas of um, what designing learning mean, but how does it look like in the classroom and how does it relate to you as a teacher? As I mentioned just now, the teacher takes on the role of a designer and you have to think about the kind of resources that you bring into the classroom. You have to think about the structures of power, the kind of relationship that you will have with your students when you use different types of resources, different types of technology in a classroom. As a designer of learning, the teacher judges the best way in which the learner can achieve the learning outcomes. And you are very mindful of the kind of resources, tools, technologies, and what this can do and cannot do. So I want to introduce to you um, the idea of semiotic technologies. Now, this idea um, came from the work of Theo van Leeuwen and Emilia Jonov. Um, and one of the key aspects of this is to see that semiotic technologies are not just tools that are neutral. The, 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 the tools, the technologies that you bring to the classroom 
in fact shape the way you represent knowledge. It also affect the way you interact with your students. As such, they are not just tools, but they are really practices um, that will change teaching and learning interactions in the classroom. So that is the notion of semiotic technologies. And, and really it includes the range of things. It could be the learning platforms that Professor Yoshiko talked uh, talk about. It could be the kind of video conferencing software that we are using right now, Zoom, or the different apps that you use for learning. I know in Singapore, we are very, uh, um, like, well, the students appreciate the use of Kahoot, a game-based app where you're able to uh, use quiz in a classroom. And all these are semiotic technologies that you bring in. And what I want to do in the next part of the presentation is to think about what are some of the questions we need to have when we are introducing various types of tools, or in this case, we call semiotic technologies in the classroom. So just as a designer chooses a tool carefully based on knowing what a tool can and cannot do, as well as the designer's familiarity and fluency with it, a teacher as a designer chooses a tool that is best fit for purpose to achieve the learning goals of the lesson. So how do we design the learning experience? Well, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here because all of you are teachers, um, very experienced educators, and the many, and, and some of the um, uh, steps that I mentioned here are not unfamiliar to you. The, important of, the importance of identifying learning outcomes, thinking about the profile of your students. Um, and then I want to focus specifically today on the third part to explore the tools for learning. The subsequent parts about deciding on the learning activities, curating the learning resources, assessing and providing feedback on the learning and refining or improving your lesson iteratively are part of things that you may already be familiar with what you're doing. So in particular today, uh, with the time that I have, I'm just going to focus on part three. When we are thinking about technologies, when we are thinking about the tools that we bring into the classroom, what are some of the considerations that we need to have? And what does it mean to have this consideration? So as I mentioned just now, the tools of a learning designer are many. It can also include the use of the whiteboard that we have. These are also tools um, that are used in the learning interaction. Could be PowerPoint, uh, slideshows, videos, um, learning management system. We talk about quiz games, but they are arranged. I mean, educational apps as well as learning analytics platform um, that you can bring into the classroom. So these are some examples of the tools. But what I think will be of value is for us to think about these tools. When I use a particular tool, say a slideshow, how is content, how is knowledge represented? When I use another, when, when I use this tool, how is the power and rapport between me and the students managed? And of course, when I use this particular tool, how does the learning unfold? So one example would be say the whiteboard. Okay, we are all very familiar uh, with the whiteboard in many of our classrooms. In some of our classrooms, we are using the blackboard. And we think about, okay, how are these three different aspects um, expressed? So for instance, you can use the whiteboard to do several things. You can use it to reinforce the knowledge, repeat what has been said. You can use it to reformulate your knowledge, some of the sharing using the uh, initiation response feedback sequence. You can use a whiteboard, of course, to explain, elaborate the knowledge, add details, clarify, uh, write down the learning objectives, organize knowledge using mind maps, um, disambiguate knowledge, um, demonstrate um, your knowledge, the process of um, knowledge building. For instance, uh, in a mathematical classroom, you, um, you have a question and then you show the working of it all. And you can have assessment of knowledge, getting students to come on to write their responses on the whiteboard uh, so that you will be able to see whether they have understood what you wanted to teach at all. Now, this may seem fairly commonsensical because many of the good teachers will do it almost intuitively. These are the things that we can do with whiteboard. This is how knowledge can be represented. But if you think about, say, an online lesson over Zoom, you may have to consider what are some of the things that we used to be able to do with the whiteboard that we cannot do anymore. If you think about, say, some classroom that I've been to, um, they, have the power, uh, they have the screen that covers most of the whiteboard 
And as a result, the teacher will be using the, the, the slideshow and the screen more than the whiteboard. <coughs> Again, you can think about what are some of the things that are lost um, when the whiteboard cannot be used. What about the pedagogic relations with the whiteboard? Well, you can think about the kind of more authoritative kind of uh, positioning that you have the students because you are standing in front of a whiteboard, you are high in power relations, socially distanced. And in fact, you are also positioning yourself as a knowledge authority when you're standing in front of the whiteboard. So unlike the PowerPoint, teacher is still able to redirect her teaching and address teachable moments because you are not stuck with the sequence of slides. Um, you are able to have more flexibility and it allows for a greater co-construction knowledge uh, of knowledge approach as opposed to say PowerPoint slideshow. For instance, right now, I'm really just sharing my knowledge in a very didactic manner to you. And then you think about the, the, how the use of a whiteboard organizes the learning experience for the students. Recognizing that teaching is still largely didactic um, and it's more teacher-centered than student-centered, but we also recognize that over instruction may not always be um, as bad as we make it out to be because there's value in that consolidation. There's a value in helping students um, presenting certain key concepts for the students to reckon, understand as well. So really, when we think about knowledge representation, so that was an example of a very familiar whiteboard uh, as a technology that we use. But if you think about knowledge representation, think about things in terms of how it, uh, it reinforces certain types of, um, of learning theories. I, uh, it expresses certain uh, learning theories, for instance, whether it uh, is behaviorist in nature, where you're using the tool to reinforce certain knowledge, or is social constructivist in nature where the tool allows you to have a more inquiry-based and collaborative discussion. And I'm going to share with you later on how a learning platform could allow for that. Or is more reflexive in nature where there's a mix of both the uh, didactic teaching as well as the inquiry-based uh, learning. And then, of course, you think about the pedagogic relations. Is it authoritative where the teacher is positioned as a knowledge authority? Is it more participative in nature between the teacher and the students? Is it more formal or could it be more informal in nature? And finally, um, the organization of learning. So is it uh, allowing you to move from principle to application? So a more deductive learning approach? Or is it one that allows you to get students to explore first and then after that, you help them consolidate your, their, their understanding, which is a more inductive learning approach? So different tools are able to help you do different things. Now, I've talked about a whiteboard. I'm gonna talk about another very familiar technology that we use in the classroom, PowerPoint. Now it's interesting to note also that PowerPoint was first invented for sales pitch. It was first called Cocky Dot after the person who first invented it. Um, and the purpose of it was really to highlight key ideas in company presentations and pitch sales messaging messages more effectively. That was the reason why PowerPoints were first invented. Now, we see PowerPoints being brought into the classroom for teaching and learning. We see PowerPoint being used in talks like this. And how does it, how does it change the way we, uh, we teach and learn? Do we then, because we are using PowerPoint, um, reduce ourselves or limit ourselves to making key pictures sharing key ideas uh, in very bite-sized bullet point format to our students. Again, the question is, if you are doing that because of the technology's influence, what is being lost and what is being gained in the whole process when knowledge is represented in bullet point forms, uh, where, where uh, the, the use of the technology may offer or constrain the way we represent certain ideas. And now we, we, we reflect upon what we are doing right now, right? As a Zoom, using Zoom, a video conference technology in online learning. And the use of Zoom has become very popular in the last um, two years, right? I mean, 2020 and 2021 because of the pandemic. And many a times uh, it is used as a way for synchronous online learning where you're able to get all students on board at the same time and you can uh, interact with them, share your slides and, and uh, engage with them like you would do in the classroom. But again, the question is, what, what is lost and gained in this whole process? It's important for us to uh, have rules of engagement over Zoom. 
And, and in my classes, this is what I, I, I do. The three Ps that I try to encourage them to be mindful of, presence, participation, and being patient with one another because it's a fairly new medium when we first started out. So it's important to set the rules of engagement clearly. But think about, um, again, the three big questions with regard to semiotic technologies. Knowledge representation in a Zoom, okay? You're able to share screen, you're able to have the visualization of knowledge multimodally uh, through language, images, animation, and sound. Everybody is able to visualize the knowledge that you have, which is great. What about the organization of learning? Well, if you're using that slideshow, there's a very clear structuring and sequencing that can be communicated. You're able to organize and order the stages um, in a very systematic way. You can signal with breakout rooms, signal the time, you can use polls. But what about the pedagogic relations? Well, again, it can be fairly authoritative, formal, teacher-centered, and socially distanced. As much as I want to reach out to you now, when I'm using my slideshow, I'm unable to see all the faces. Uh, you are unable to really speak back to me unless you interrupt. So there are certain limitations in terms of the pedagogic relations that we have. And of course, the format of this ends up with me delivering a lecture to you. So the learning experience of the students can be limited to the teacher's presentation of the content knowledge, which is what is happening here. And unless it's complemented with other le lesson activities that facilitate a more inquiry-based learning approach to learning, it can, it can then be reduced to a more transmissionist, behaviorist model of learning. But not the, nonetheless, we recognize its value as well uh, of Zoom in approximating the classroom learning experience. It provides a baseline content of slides that are being used um, we are able to be recorded. And then of course, uh, with recording, you're able to go back to it. Um, the students may uh, go back to it, replay certain parts in which they're interested in or they didn't quite understand. And um, the learning experience of the student is still ultimately based on the teacher's pedagogy of how, uh, how it's designed, right? What are the costs of Zoom then? Well, there's no sense of the room and the student's attention. I, I don't know whether you are listening to me right now or you're multitasking, you're looking uh, interested, you're looking bored. I, I have no way to really respond to you uh, very easily. I can see some of your faces, but some of you have uh, turned off your video. So, so that, that could be a challenge. And the teachers may be less responsive to the development in the lesson, right? There was a case uh, in Singapore where a university lecturer um, spent 60 minutes, or is it more than 60 minutes giving a lecture uh, only to find out at the end of it all that he was on mute all along. I hope this is not the case for me. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> right, okay, that's reassuring. And, and teachers will tend to reply questions using speech and maybe also ending up presenting knowledge to students of almost to the extent of selling the content. So again, similar challenges uh, that we have. Well, there's also a range of semiotic technologies that is um, very new and exciting that we can explore a little bit more. I think Professor Yoshiko has showed uh, just now um, the use of virtual worlds. I think that's exciting. Um, the use of educational games, even augmented reality software. And essentially, while I do not have um, the time to, in this talk, to go through um, all this range of tools that you can bring to the classroom, what I hope to do is to give you some ways to think about um, the tools that you bring in, in relation to, um, to some of the challenges as well as the opportunities they offer, right? But one thing we also recognize is that while the technology may have certain defaults, they may nudge us towards certain ways of teaching and learning, it is not um, deterministic, right? It may influence, and it will, oh, sorry, it will influence, but it doesn't mean that you are passive and you have no choice, okay? But what it means is that when you're aware of how these tools can be used, you are able to use it more intentionally, right? So you're able to resist, you're able to uh, still shape um, the way that teaching and learning should be done, right? So at this last part, I, I just want to also share with you what I have done uh, in my classes. So we talk about Zoom as being an example of synchronous learning, and we had a question with regard to that. Now we also, uh, I want to share with you the use of Edmodo uh, as a way in which you can bring about both asynchronous learning because it's a, a learning platform where you're allowing for interactions with the students 
and also synchronous learning where you have everybody to meet on at Modo at a particular point in time uh, for the lesson. So I will talk about at Modo as a tool, and then you can think about what is gain and loss in the use of at Modo, right? So at Modo is like a Facebook kind of um, interface, okay? In this case, uh, this was what I did with my students, okay? I discussed studies group, and uh, the instructions I gave was this, okay? They had to read two articles, okay? And then do the asynchronous part by posting two insights and one question on the, uh, we call it the learning community page. And then on the day of the lesson, they have to come and respond to one another, okay? And um, watch some of the videos that I'll upload and we will have a time of discussion. So this was what we did. And um, this is an example of what they did in the asynchronous digital learning. So you'll find that they are very, um, thoughtful in terms of reflecting on the readings and what mm -hmm. happened for us is that after they reflected we are able then very easily to comment on one another uh, ideas and we are also able to connect to other forms of knowledge so for instance on the right hand side you'll find that there was an idea of amic and ethic being raised and we are very is we are able then to connect it to say other websites that will give a bit more information okay we are able to have synchronous digital learning when they came together to, uh, to discuss, right, uh, at a particular point in time. And synchronous digital learning doesn't mean that I would have to be the one giving the talk because on the topic that we had, we had very good videos that were made by um, top scholars in different universities, short videos that we can bring in and get them to watch. And I will be there to interact and engage with them as well. And this is uh, some example of the kind of questions and interactions that we have with one another as we watch some of these very short videos. Okay, so this was synchronous digital learning because everybody, all the students were watching at the same time and we were engaging and discussing with one another after that. So there was, this was the feedback and I encouraged them to share what their thoughts were uh, at the end of the lesson. And this was some of the very positive uh, and interesting comments that they had. Okay, they felt that it was more uh, well, it, it was it was uh, more interactive than what it would have happened in the classroom. They felt there was, mm. there was intensive mental work that every every student was totally engaged. Uh, they were able to uh, contribute and and uh, share ideas and knowledge with one another, build on um, the kind of uh, ideas and comments that their their fellow students have given. And in fact, many times the conversation they had was with one another rather than with me. And sometimes when I, by, by the time I got to their comment, they have already sought out some of this very interesting discussion amongst themselves. So that's one value. If you compare to a classroom where only one person can talk to me at one time or compared to a Zoom video conference where only one or two person can interact. Uh, and mostly again, it's centered on me rather than with one another, All right? So, so these are some of the comments again getting students to voice their sentiments in a non-threatening manner, even the very quiet students like what Professor Yoshiko mentioned, are able then to feel comfortable to share their thoughts. And this is a, a, a very good comment that, that encouraged me. And so essentially what I wanted to do in this presentation is to share with you some of these tools uh, that you have available as a designer of learning. And more importantly, is to think about the kind of value and cost each of the two can bring in when you design the learning experience of your students. So how do we think about it? As I mentioned, three different uh, big questions that you can ask. How is content expressed? By default, can I change, can I shape it? What is, the, what is the pedagogic relations? Uh, does it allow for a lot more peer interaction or is it one that is centering on me as a teacher? How do I man manage the power and rapport? And of course, how does it um, allow me to unfold the learning? Is it in a more deductive manner or is it in a more inductive manner? So I hope that I've answered the question to some extent on how we can design learning experiences. Of course, there's more to that. This is just the part on exploring the tools for learning. Subsequent to that, after you have talked about the tools, you will think about the learning activities, the resources, and you have to think about the kind of assessment and feedback that you want to provide on the students' learning. And, and it's an iterative process because as a designer, you don't get it right the first time. Some of you may be familiar with the design-based research approach to learning and, and it's about iterations and continuous refinement as you grow as a teacher. 
The last part of my presentation, um, and I will go through this fairly quickly, is the recognition that in order for digital learning to uh, work, we need to have um, an ecosystem to support it. So you have to think about your context, right? Is there reliable internet for the students in your, in your, um, in your context? Do they have mobile devices they can use? Whether you have um, the right apps and tools, and we have focused on that. But more than that, um, is there quality digital resources? And just now, Prof uh, Professor Yoshiko shared about the Voice of America, where you are able to then appropriate into the classroom. Think about the teacher's um, com confidence and competence in teaching, as well as things, aspects such as the students' digital literacies, um, how ready they are to engage with technology, the kind of structural support, parental kind of buy-in, parental support uh, with the work that you want to do in this area. The last uh, thing that I want to mention really is an observation that I've made by two uh, key scholars, Bill Cope and Marin Calantis, uh, uh, in this area. And they say that, well, it seems that even though technology has changed and there's a lot more possibilities, uh, we still end up doing the same old stuff. Print textbook become e-textbook, in-person lecture becomes video lectures, teacher led classroom become video conference discussion, um, and select response tests were automated, lockstep syllabus became lockstep management system. So it seems that while technology offers a lot more possibilities, the observation that we have around the world is that we are just doing almost the same thing with new technology. However, the, the, the academics of Bill Cope and Mary Calantis suggest that, well, things need not be that way. We can challenge ourselves to think about new possibilities. And what are some of these possibilities? Well, some of you may have heard of some of these ideas, sociable learning, engaged learning, deep learning, recursive learning, equitable learning, where different beliefs and ideas of language education uh, that you wanted to do when you first started out perhaps as a teacher or when you read certain research article and you felt maybe I can bring about greater creativity, greater criticality, foster perhaps uh, more collaboration among students. And these are some of this aspiration that people might have when it comes to language education. And one of the things that we recognize today is that the tools are available. Reform in education are achievable because of the affordances that we have with the remarkable development of technologies, things that were hard and expensive to do in education in the past are now easy and cheap. And many of these old ideals of what you believe in sociable learning, engaged learning, deep learning, recursive learning, equitable learning can now be made possible with the tools that you have. So on this note, I would uh, end. And if you're interested uh, in some of the work that we have done, uh, I published a book called Designing Learning with Embodied Teaching. I focus today on the topic of semiotic technologies. If you're interested, you can find out a little bit more about the other aspects of how you can design learning experiences in the classroom. And uh, I also want to make a pitch um, later on, uh, Willie has shared about some of the postgraduate programs. Uh, later, you will hear from uh, Dr. Willie as well on, um, on some of the, uh, on, on, on what, what uh, on some of the ideas we have on language education. And if you're interested in our work, you can consider the postgraduate uh, programs uh, at NIE as a possibility as well. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one question. <coughs> um, 